It is now my privilege to introduce to you Andrew Smith, Head of Business, Customer Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. Andrew and I met, gosh, nine years ago, and uh, so we've had a, a working relationship over that time, which has been a real privilege for me. So a little bit about Andrew. Andrew started his career with the Rural Finance Corporation of Victoria in 1988 as a cadet valuer before working as an agribusiness relationship manager and then regional manager. He then spent 12 years with Westpac in a range of commercial and agribusiness banking strategy and leadership roles in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. Andrew rejoined finance, uh, Rural Finance as the General Manager Agribusiness in 2011. And in 2014, he moved into the Rural Bank Executive as a General Manager Agribusiness, leading the national sales, marketing and communications and research teams. Andrew has tertiary qualifications in agricultural science and business and is a registered property valuer. Andrew is also a graduate of the Australian Rural Leadership Program and the Australian Institute of Company Directors course. Andrew began his current role as head of business customer in January 2018. And in just over 12 months, Andrew transformed business banking, now called business customer, by endorsing a clear operating model with focus on customer segments and specialist capabilities. It's my privilege to welcome Andrew Smith. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and great to be here, and what a great venue as well. Well done again, Sue and team. I think it's uh, just great to be amongst some like-minded people and really stimulated by the conversation today. So I wanted to open up with a, a bit of a reference to the whole Royal Commission environment, and I think Sue made reference earlier to the fact that one of the comments that Commissioner Hayne made on the way through there was that it sounded like selling became the focus of attention too often it became the sole focus of attention. And I think the disclaimer, if you like, that Sue put to that not too long ago was that unethical selling may have become too much the focus of attention. I think at an industry level, we need to be careful that there are a rotten few, but there are systemic things as well. And, and I think I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of the banking industry that there's work to be done here and no one is perfect. So, a bit of concept of trust, and I know that this word's been used quite a bit this morning, but it is one of the most pervasive and, ironically, the most least noticed aspects of life. Because we are social animals by design. We need trust in order to function, unless we choose to opt out of human society and live life as a recluse. Indeed, sociologist Nicholas Luhmann said, a complete absence of trust would prevent even getting up in the morning. For that reason, humans face the world with an attitude of trust. Unless there is strong evidence that says otherwise, we assume that when we walk out the front door and onto the street in the morning, a car won't try and run us down. Trust is hard-earned and rapidly dissolved. It is essential social capital that should never be treated recklessly. Trust and reputation are critical to business success, especially in our industry and trust must be earned. Building up a reputation can take decades. So I read that Confucius once said, all rulers need only three resources, weapons, food, and trust. The ruler who cannot have all of these three should give up the weapons first, then the food, but should hold on to trust no matter what, because without trust we cannot stand. According to the Financial Planning Association of Australia, Australians are twice as likely to turn to family and friends for information, around 41% on financial matters and planning, as they are to turn to a professional financial planner. It's sort of interesting. Knowing whom to trust is obviously a barrier to working with a financial professional, and most Australians, around 64%, say trustworthiness is a very important consideration well, 70% say they don't know who to trust. So it's all very interesting. It's a fairly sceptical view, that, that, that photo. And obviously, banks historically have held a trusted position in the community and in society. But since the GFC, in particular around the world, they have lost their position as some of the most trusted institutions. The GFC brought fears about the safety of some of the investments and even bank deposits which in general governments then stepped in to ultimately guarantee in order to stabilise and renew trust, but since then trust at risk has been different. It's about doing the right thing. 
There's no doubt it is a challenging time for our banks. With the effects of the Royal Commission into Misconduct casting a shadow across the industry, increased regulatory oversight, and a renewed debate about culture, trust in the banking sector, and in fact across most corporate industries, is at an all-time low. We did hear earlier that out of the Royal Commission, the total cost of the four major banks and AMP has been estimated around $7.5 billion in terms of customer remediation, and that's playing out at the moment with refunds, but also risk compliance and regulatory costs. But the cost of community trust, however, is much harder to estimate and maybe more challenging to recover. Customer expectations and preferences in how they wish to engage and interact with a financial services provider, which aren't always banks, are constantly changing. And these continue to be uncertainty around the pace, scale and breadth of disruption, especially driven by technology. This coupled with slowing credit growth, pressure on bank margins and increasing costs as bank looks to bolster their compliance functions means the market share of Australian banking customers is coming more and more contested. However, when the current environment is contrasted with our own business, we at the Bendigo and Adelaide Bank find ourselves quite well positioned in an environment that plays to our strengths. Indeed, our, our chairman at the Royal Commission was right towards the back end of the actual uh, hearings, but the evidence that he was asked to give centred around our approach and how that sounded quite different to some of our peers. So at the heart of his testimony was the fact that consumer confidence remains central to our long-term strategy and building relationships with customers that brought long-term prosperity was the goal. So they go hand in hand. I just thought I'd share this little slide. There's so many cartoons when you go searching for them and, and you don't want to beat up the industry. And I just thought this one, just with a bit of levity, spoke to that it was very revealing, it was very disturbing. There were some really heart-wrenching stories through that commission and no real winners, but I think the future remediation is where we will see some change. So for Bendigo Bank, the Roy Morgan Net Trust Score ranks the trustworthiness of Australian brands, exploring the elements of trust, including reliability, commitment to customers, knowledge of staff, ease of contact and prior experiences in addition to other criteria. It's ranked by more than 4,000 consumers each year and Bendigo Bank had the third highest net trust score across all Australian brands. Did you know that? Other brands in the top 10 were Aldi, NRMA, Qantas, Bunnings, to name a few. But there's always more to do and ways to improve and trust is never an end to itself. Trust and lending are commonly linked and the provision of credit is a primary and imperative role of banks. Again, David Robertson in the Sales Trends Report worded this really neatly. He said, the role of a bank is to act as a bridge between investors who have excess money and borrowers who have a vision of need but not enough money. And importantly, to be a foundation of trust for the financial system. Every person, profession, industry and institution needs trust. We need it because we rely on others acting as they say they will and because we need others to accept that we will act as we say we will. It's mutually in inclusive. To regain trust and respect, Australians will need to see evidence from the banks doing the right thing, actions and outcomes rather than apologies, promises and fines. How we do this and more importantly, how do we maintain it? I did want to share a shared value model uh, which the bank has embraced uh, over the last five years and uh, we focus on providing shared value which involves creating economic value in a way that also creates value for society by addressing its needs and challenges. The founders of the notion of shared value capitalism concluded that short-term profit objectives bind firms to the need to nurture the long-term health of the markets from which they draw their revenues. Shared value is not just social responsibility, philanthropy or even sustainability, but a new way to achieve economic success. It is not on the margin of what companies do, but at the centre. We believe that it can give rise to the next major transformation of business thinking. And ultimately, shared value is a strategy for developing the future market while also strengthening economies 
the marketplace and those communities. So just to talk about community banking, I was pleased to see Suzanne is one of our volunteer directors out in the network, and uh, it's a great example of shared value. Our community bank model celebrates 20 years last year in October. In response to banks pulling out of communities, both regional and in metropolitan areas across the country, we pioneered this model and sparked a community-led movement in many places. Our first community bank opened in Rapanyup and Minyup in the Victorian Wimmera in, in 1998, and that was pretty closely followed by Upway, our first metropolitan branch, uh, just a couple of months later. And just last week, we opened an on-campus community bank at the Swinburne University of Technology's Hawthorne campus in Melbourne, with profits to be reinvested back into scholarship programs, research funding grants, sustainable infrastructure and local clubs. So our community bank model has since delivered more than 200 million in contributions back to local communities, generating jobs and local economic growth. If we do hark back to the late 90s, and let's remember this was before there were other banking options like your phone or your, your laptop, it's hard to believe, I know, but these communities felt quite powerless. The, the bank leaving town was a very big symbolic thing for those communities, and people marched on the streets in protest. Banks were pulling out for, for financial and business reasons, which on face value could be argued, but we knew the impact this was having on the community and driven by a purpose, we sought to find a solution. We've since opened 320 locations nationwide and Bendigo Bank shares the revenue generated from the customer's banking with the local community bank. And they use their share to run the branch, they pay staff wages, rent, operating costs, such as maintenance, et cetera, and then use what's left to invest in local community initiatives and then pay shareholder dividends. In the last financial year, it returned more than $22 million in community contributions, paid around $5.5 million in shareholder dividends and employed 1,500 people around Australia, around 2,000 volunteer directors with $100 million in wages and services spent locally. So I hope you can see that shared value concept coming through. Interesting, we are a sales organisation. So uh, we recently launched a significant piece of research into our brand positioning, and from that we launched the Better Big Bank campaign. Feedback tells us that Bendigo Bank is known and loved for the support it provides to customers and communities all over Australia. And indeed, throughout last year, we were consistently ranked as the most trusted bank. But our position as the fifth largest bank, and as a real contender to the big four, based on core banking capabilities, is arguably one of banking's best kept secrets. We tend to be quite humble, tend not to chest beat too much. And so this campaign had two aims. Firstly, to educate people about the fact that we do have strong banking capability and can be competitive and have a strong product offering. But also remind people that we beat the big four on trust, customer service and putting the interests of customers first. Thought I'd uh, reference optimism, Victor. The, um, the, the quote from Winston Churchill I thought was pretty cool. So he once said, optimists see opportunities in every difficulty. Optimists have a successful mindset. You simply cannot operate a successful business in a difficult economic environment unless you cast off the negative emotions of fear, uncertainty and worry. And optimism is defined as the benefit or the belief that good things will happen to you and that negative events are a temporary setback to be overcome. I know last year at this breakfast, Sue and Victor spoke about purposeful optimism, adopting an optimistic approach to doing business, leading communities and living our lives. It is derived from strategy and built on substance through exploring possibilities and opportunity. So I'm at heart an optimist, much preferring to see the world as glass half full. But as a banker, it doesn't pay to be blindly optimistic or things can go a little bit awry. But being a purposeful optimist and cultivating gratitude and resilience in a team can take you a very long way, I find. When I took on the business bank just over 12 months ago, having previously led the rural sales team for a number of years, things weren't in a really good state, let, let's be open. 
at a, at a divisional level. And many of my colleagues were saying, wow, that's going to be a challenge for you. And I said, yep, but it's also a significant opportunity. And I did show my agricultural colours in explaining this to people a few times. In, in farmer terms, this part of the bank, it's got really good country. It's got great soils. There's some fences that need fixing. The cattle are pretty sound, but we do need some new genetics and we'll invest in some fertiliser and spark the place up again. We then quickly set about developing our customer value proposition, and in my mind, that's the heart of any customer and sales strategy. The key words we landed on through a series of workshops and effort internally was relationships, trust and community were the, the foundations. As I've done before, we work very closely with Sue uh, through all of this phase in developing our style strategy and operating system. And I have to say there's a fair bit of mutual respect between us in terms of the work we've done together. And I've really uh, seen that underpin how we go about developing our business and do love this model, I do have to say. I think with any major project, it's important to have some wins along the way. And these keep the energy up and maintain the focus and commitment. A couple of weeks ago, I travelled to Sydney to attend the DBM Consultants Australian Financial Awards for 2019. And proudly collected five of the six business awards on behalf of the bank, and that did include the most recommended business bank award. It seemed a bit like early days to be collecting awards such as this, but the results were from direct customer feedback from over 400 of our customers about their experience with us, how they rated us, and that is then compared against our peers. And apparently, I don't know the actual numbers, but there was a fairly good gap in there. And I had a few of the marketing agencies coming up afterwards, keen to have a chat, all, all good things through selling and networking, but also a couple of the big banks saying to me, how'd you do that? What's the secret sauce? And I said, look, actually, it's pretty simple. We've maintained our focus around relationships, doing what we say we're going to do, and act fairly. Our ethos has long been to feed into the prosperity of the community, not off it. So just in closing, Robert Solomon and Fernando Flores write in their book, Building Trust in Business, Politics, Relationships in Life, that the key to trust is action and commitment, and commitments made and commitments honoured. Focusing on profit alone is not a long-term strategy for success. The longer game focuses on trust and honour as core business values resulting in happier and more productive employees, increased innovation and happier customers and partners who ultimately benefit from better products and service. Trust and the concept of sales trust, which is one I've been thinking about, really speaks to your integrity as a person and the self-worth that you build up. And as a salesperson, you'll look to those traits in your own company, and the company will look for you to be dependable and truthful. So groups that have trust in each other tend to work better and are often more likely to offer assistance and direction to help each other succeed. When you feel good about yourself and the company, your self-confidence grows and a customer or client who has confidence in you is basically displaying that they have sales trust in you. In this digitally and globally integrated economy, trust is the new currency. Without it, service economies cannot function. The companies that misuse personal data or abuse trust will be the ones that take the biggest hit. It is for this reason that credibility, transparency, integrity and trustworthiness as key leadership competencies in the new economy are so critical. Trust and reputation must be bottom line requirements for all leaders. It's a hard economic driver and not a self-value metric. And as the markets continue to evolve with fintechs, digital banks, disruption, automated uh, decisioning and AI and home lending, we'll need to be underpinning all of that approach with trust. So I don't think it's good enough to hide behind an updated privacy statement, a values commitment or a service promised on a website. Whilst it's important to state your intent, it means nothing if you don't deliver on your commitment with integrity. Upholding this commitment is essential for all corporations to navigate this brave new digital world. And as leaders, the challenge lies with us all. You must be seen to be doing the right thing in the right way for the right reasons in the way that you said you would. 
Thank you.